Devil Country by David Hardy Chapter 2 His armor was fresh polished, and the black finish glinted in the flickering lamplight. With high carriage, he walked through the gray stone halls, and all those who approached gave him wide berth. He was followed by a massive fuel hound with a galloping gait, steel gray fur shaggy but well groomed, and taller from head to tail than most men. A woman followed behind the hound, matching the steps of the knight head down. Her hands were bound with a long chain, acting as a reminder to others of the low status of this wretched dark creature. She wore a rough woolen dress, which was muddy and frayed, so that her bare feet could be seen beneath the hem. Her age was unknowable. Wrinkles lined her face and gray streaked her hair, but her body was still supple. The dark-skinned slave did not speak, for she only knew words enough to follow directions. As they passed through the halls, servants would bow their heads to the honored knight, before scowling harshly as the slave girl passed by. The girl would invariably stare back at them from under wild hair, piercing them with harsh green eyes. Eventually, her master arrived at a hall where golden sunlight fell in shafts onto the faces of the dukes of days long past. The slave looked around with a flicker of her eyes, seeing the gilded portraits hanging upon the stone walls, stretching up to the ceiling. The knight paid no attention to the faces he had served for so long. Instead, he walked with purpose towards a simple, full-bodied painting of the King of Crustland, a lean man wearing full plate, supporting his stance with a long, shining sword. The portrait touched the floor and stretched high over the viewers' heads, and the man in it looked down upon them, his eyes following them through the room. To the girl's surprise, her master reached behind the painting and pulled harshly. A secret hinge squeaked, and before the woman's eyes, a dark staircase leading downward was revealed. Wordlessly, the knight began to walk down, but stopped when he realized his charge did not follow. Come, he said firmly, calling both his dog and slave with the same command. The hound disappeared down the stair, but the woman looked around and saw no one to witness their passage. She was wary of the darkness beneath the castle, knowing vaguely of what the Crusslish did to those of the Eastern faith. Still, there was no escape for her. She had a choice between following her master down those stairs or death. She walked forward, hurrying to catch up. Once she was through, the knight turned a crank on the inside of the staircase and the picture frame swung closed, casting them into true darkness. She was led down the stairs for a long time. The knight knew the passage intimately, without the need of a torch, but the slave kept a hand upon the rough stones, stepping with care so as not to pitch forward and tumble to her doom. Eventually, they turned a corner, and she saw the glow of candlelight on a curved wall. She was able to walk with more confidence, and hurried to close the distance between herself and the knight. They emerged suddenly onto a huge, circular balcony over a brightly lit pit lined with sand. She heard foul laughter from all around the chamber as men leaned over the viewing boxes, leering down into a deep arena. She gasped lightly as she looked down into the pit and saw two of the insect creatures. They were fighting one another with flashing steel and buzzing to split the humans' ears. "'Sir Denning, good of you to join us,' said a voice from the balcony." You brought the slave woman? She looked towards the voice and saw a man in fine robes with long jowls on his face. He scowled just as the servants above had. He seemed of a high enough rank that she wasted no time in averting her gaze and bowing low. There may be use for her in the arena, Sir Plinth, her master said as he unclasped and removed his helmet, placing the great black thing on the table. His face was craggy and dour, and he had shaved his head bald. His eyes, ice blue, were cold in both color and expression. The fuel hound sauntered over to the side of the balcony and curled up to sleep as soon as the helmet touched the table. The fight in the pit came to a sudden close as a spotted gray devil was disarmed, his sword sundered by a hard blow from his brown rival. Off balance in his dodge, he fell backwards and found the brown devil's sword at his neck. Both looked towards the balconies as a cheer rose up from the men gathered there. 
All eyes in the room turned towards the northernmost balcony, where a portly man sat, his face obscured in shadow, speaking with a tall, thin man standing beside him. The two of them appeared to be deep in conversation, but soon noticed that the seated man's decision was needed. He waved for attention and silence, before he cried out magnanimously over the arena, Spare him! to the cheers and boos of the assembled men. The two men then put their heads back down and went back to business. As soon as the devils heard this, they both relaxed in clear relief. The brown devil held out a hand to help the gray one to his feet. Arm in arm, the two devils left the arena through an arched doorway. Grady is losing his edge, said Plinth, as he watched the injured gray devil leave. But that ugly brown thing is promising. Where is his grace? His usual place, answered Plinth, with a gesture to the portly man in the northernmost balcony, annoyed at Denning's insistence upon business even at the fighting pits. He's speaking with the Norton Danish ambassador about that young pup coming to marry Lady Eileen. The woman was surprised to see just a hint of emotion cross Denning's face, a twitch of the mouth down, but it was only a momentary crack in the knight's disposition. His grace has heard many times my objection to this pairing, said Denning. Perhaps you and the lady would have made a better match, taunted Plinth. Denning scowled and looked away. I simply do not approve of him introducing such a weak heir into his family. I won't lie. I agree with you up to that point, Sir Denning. I have heard tell he is a craven coward, an ineffective strategist, and has only succeeded by virtue of standing in the shadow of his older brother's conquests. Outside of marrying into royalty, there is nothing about the man that would recommend him for the lady. Have you spoken with his grace about your objections? asked Denning. You have his ear more than most. Some, but he is uh, insistent. I suspect he has some other plot in mind, muttered Plinth. Still, enough business. Are you ready for our duel? I am. I hope yours has been practicing, said Plinth, swelling with pride. Don't forget, my Jerome is a veteran of over a hundred battles. He may be getting on in years, but he still fights like a lion. How old is he? They do last a while, don't they? He was about to be put out to pasture ten years ago, but then I bought him. Rather expensive, thanks to the rare colour, but with years of use still to come. He would have been wasted fighting heathens for scraps if I hadn't bought him up, Sir Plinth said, laughing. And of course, he was a package deal with his little spawn. Lucky for you. Indeed, the young insect you sold me shows promise. We shall see, Denning. The two men watched as human attendants rushed out into the arena with rakes and shifted the blood-soaked sands to hide the black stains. Once they had finished, they rushed away, and the cries of the men in the balconies began anew. The slave woman watched from the shadows of the balcony, near the slumbering hound, but not so close as to let it snap at her. Sir Denning's nameless hound was ever quiet and gentle with its master, but its reputation as a warhound had reached even this eastern slave's ears. A horn blared over the scene. From opposite sides of the arena, two devils entered, keeping their eyes on one another at all times. The girl watched in fascination. She had seen devils when her city was attacked, and her neighbors killed. She had taken up arms against one, but was nearly killed in the attempt, it was only by virtue of her sex that a human knight had intervened on her behalf before the devil could tear her apart. She had, in a moment of weakness, thanked the knight Sir Denning for saving her life. That was before the shackles were closed around her wrists. On her left, she saw the devil under Sir Plinth's stewardship. He was indeed getting on in years, his plates graying at the edges. He was still, however, an attractive blue and the gray made him the color of a cloudy sky. He held a sword in one hand, a tall shield in the other, and held the other two arms at the ready to intercept any blows. As he walked, he beat his sword upon his shield, tapping out a rhythm of intimidation. On the other side, she saw the challenger. His frame was svelte and spry, and he forewent a shield, wielding instead a great sword meant for two hands in one. 
His color was the merry blue of a clear sky, and with the lingering hint of fuzz still upon his face. She heard a clink, and looked over at the small table between her master and Sir Plinth. Plinth had placed a bag of coins upon the table, and was staring expectantly at Denning's impassive face. Denning seemed to hold a great deal of contempt for that little bag of coin on the table, but even so, he reached into a pouch at his side and withdrew his own answering bet without the slightest bit of humor. He turned his face towards the arena where the two devils were standing side by side, looking up expectantly. "'Begin!' cried the shadowy duke, looking up from his meeting, and the two devils flew at one another as he turned away. The slave woman watched, enraptured by the flashes of steel in the flickering torchlight. It was clear that the younger devil was the faster of the two. He darted around his competitor, weaving and dodging the wide slices that the older devil made with his sword. To her surprise, the older devil held his own, and moved with grace equal to his opponent. He also had more patience than the younger devil, and when he saw his chance, he took it. The slice drew black blood, and the balconies roared. First blood goes to me, Denning, said Sir Plinth, relieved to see how his devil was faring. We shall see, came the answer, without emotion. Emboldened by the black stain upon his sword, the old devil continued the fight. Their weapons clashed loudly as they danced around one another, giving the stands a show. The two devils had a similar style, and they matched one another blow for blow, opening up cracks in the other's armor. It seemed as if the older devil was the more skilled, however, and the spectators screamed for the young waif's head. Denning's face was unreadable. With a nod of his head, the younger devil broke away and made a big, showy attack, intending to land a blow upon his older counterpart. The men in the balconies cheered at how long this youngster lasted against such a veteran. Weapons clashed once again, and the attack nearly seemed for naught. The slave woman saw what the men did not. The older devil's breathing had become shallow and labored. He was tired even as the young one stood tall and strong, breathing evenly. Soon the old devil would be spent. She also saw that while these two devils fought, neither one showed any hatred. On the contrary, the young one seemed to hold a great deal of respect for his opponent, and the veteran's eyes watched the young devil with pride. Even as she thought this, the youth moved again, Faster than the eye could see, he buzzed and struck the old devil upon the side of the mandible with the handle of his sword, faster than the old one could react. Unable to dodge, Jerome was sent flying backwards and fell hard upon the ground. The fight was over when the young devil swung his sword with the precision of an artist's brushstroke and made a shallow mark upon the front of his enemy's chest. The sight of blood, even incidental blood, caused a frenzy of cheers from the stands. There was unmistakable pain upon the old devil's face. The girl was astonished to realize she felt sorry for these creatures, forced to fight for the pleasure of bloodthirsty slavers. Stunned, Jerome weakened his grip on his sword, and the other devil kicked it out of his hand before holding his weapon over his opponent's neck. He was victorious, and seemed astonished at his own performance. A lusty cheer filled the arena. Both devils turned their faces to the balcony, where Duke Novem was sitting still conferring with the Nottin Danish ambassador. The girl turned to face the two owners of the fighting devils. Plinth was disappointed, but he didn't seem altogether concerned for his pet devil. The woman figured it was rare that the duke actually called for the death of an opponent. Denning's expression was unreadable. With a lazy start, the duke seemed to realize that a judgment was required. He gave a cursory glance to the aftermath and, seeing the old devil held down by a young upstart, began to speak. This devil is old and injured and should be put out of your misery. Put him to the sword. What? cried Plinth, turning towards Denning suddenly, rage in his features. He cannot do that. Do you have any idea the money I've spent training this devil? That cut is but a flesh wound. Quiet. His grace is rendering his opinion, was Denning's acid reply. The duke ignored the noise coming from Plinth's balcony and stared down at the young devil. Must I repeat myself, gladiator? Finish him. Unfamiliar as the slave woman was with devil emotions, the look on the younger devil's face could have been nothing but sheer 
terror. He looked down at Jerome with wide eyes and low antenna, speechless, and Jerome looked up at him with flaring gills coughing from the arena sands. It seemed for a moment as if he would not do it, and he flinched his sword a few inches away. The girl could not see the duke's face, but by his posture this seemed as if it would not end well for either devil. Unheard by any human upon the balconies, but noticed by the girl who stared with rapt attention, Jerome seemed to fill the pause with a whisper. The old devil said something, with his antenna raised, in a relieved smile. The youth answered loudly, desperation plain in his voice, although he was too far away to make out the words. Jerome spoke again, saying something with finality and grace, before closing his eyes and trying to look serene. It seemed as if the duke might call for both of their heads, until the young devil buzzed loudly. He raised up his sword and brought it down again. The cheer that rose up from the balconies hurt the girl's ears, and she turned away from the blood-stained field of battle. She had seen the pain in their eyes. When next she looked back at the arena, the youth had fallen to his knees, watching as two attendant humans dragged the headless corpse of the old devil into the opposite passage, finally free in death. Gambling, said Denning, picking up the two bags of coin. Such a useless pastime. At this, Denning gestured for his slave to approach, and he handed her the two bags. Bring these up to my bedchamber. Remember what you saw here today. You start raking the sands tomorrow. She looked down at the two bags of gold in her hand, knowing that she was the same as those wretched devils down in the pit. Her life hung on the same balance as Jerome's. For a moment, she wondered if it would be worth it to incur a knight's wrath on purpose and force him to free her from this hell. But she was not brave enough to commit such an act. Without a word, she turned away and rushed up the stairs. She would break the blood out of the sands for the rest of her days. But first, there was something she had to do.